um, and actually very few liver failures from that at all. There are some things that, that they metabolize faster and can cause more of a problem, but uh, it is important to remember that they, their metabolism, metabolism is different than ours, and to think about that. So your toxicology exam, very briefly, this is what you want to look at in triage, in the clinic, uh, to help determine what did this kid take if they're not coming in saying, my kid ate this one pill here. So, and also poison control, when you call them, they're going to want to know these things. So vitals, the blood pressure is important, it's harder in kids, I know, uh, but tachycardia, tachypnea, things like that are important to report. Pupils, do, are they pinpoint? Are they large? Is there nice sinus involved? <coughs> skin, are they diaphoretic? Do they have warm, flushed, dry skin like you might see in a Benadryl overdose? Uh, listen to the bowel sounds. If there are no bowel sounds, that's a problem. You want to think anticholinergics. If they're hyperactive, you want to think things like cholinergics. Uh, look at the reflexes, move their little arms around. Is their tone very, very tense, or are they completely pundit and placid? Uh, and then are they confused? Is their speech slurred? Harder to tell little kids, I know. Um, and if they're older and they've taken some stimulant, is their speech pressured? So that's what you want to have in mind before you call poison center. <clears throat> so we're just going to go through some cases now. It's not going to be as evidence-based as Ashcom's was, because there's not a lot of evidence in toxicology, unfortunately. A lot of it's case-based reports. So we're going to talk about some cases. <clears throat> a two-year-old male bit into a personal capsule and swallowed some of the liquid. He started foaming to the mouth and developed strider. Burns developed on the lips, mouth, esophagus, and pharynx. Short time later, the child developed respiratory stress and was intubated. What's Persil? Persil is a laundry detergent pod. Oh. I've seen these before. It's a British laundry detergent pod. They, they've had these for about 10 years longer than we have, so they have more case reports. So on day two, endoscopy was done and showed blistering of the upper airways and esophagus. Day seven, a second endoscopy was normal, and the child was discharged on the normal condition. So no bad coli, but a bad hospital course. <laughs> Second case, two-year-old male ingested aerial liquitat, also a laundry pod, also splashed some into his eyes and onto his skin. He was decontaminated and discharged for one hour post-exposure wow. in, in normal condition. Six hours later, he was brought back to the hospital unresponsive with a GCS at four. He was, of course, intubated, though two days later, his GCS was 15, he was asymptomatic, and he was discharged. Minor abnormalities were noted on the chest x-ray, a little bit of opacity, <clears throat> consistent with pneumonitis, and some corneal damage was noted on the fluorescent exam. Both of these resolved completely. Case number 1C, this is a 10-month-old with a tight pot exposure uh, to his chin, his torso, and his abdomen. His mother cleaned him up with baby wipes. He then developed urethema and blistering on the next day. And he had 2% body surface area partial thickness burns and 4% chemical dermatitis. So clearly not completely washed off. Uh, so these detergent capsules, so I brought one for you guys. Unfortunately, I only have one, and it's in a little pouch. So you're going to have to open it up and then pass it around. Don't please, wash. please don't get it wet. <laughs> please don't put it in your mouth. <laughs> so they were first marketed in Europe. 2001, so 10 years before we saw them, so they were starting to see these uh, ingestions and these complications before we were. So it's a little pouch of concentrated laundry detergent, and then it's got a soluble polyvinyl alcohol membrane. So it's very sturdy unless you get it wet or put it in your mouth, and then it perks. For the most part, it's just detergent, and then it's got a little propylene glycol and a little ethanol in some of the uh, preparations. pH is somewhere between 7 and 9, so not super acidic, but a little alkaline. <clears throat> so the AAPCC that we talked about earlier, there were 10, so far this year there have been over 10,000 exposures in kids' body matter. This is still happening quite a bit, it's still something we have to keep an eye out for, uh, and it's still something that we have to have a high suspicion that it could be worse than it actually looks initially. So in 2012 there was a study done, uh, I want to say it was three to 400 people. You can see the route of ingestion, or the route of exposure is ingestion for the most part. So it's kids, or sometimes people trying to hurt themselves putting these pods in their mouth. Uh, it also gets in the eye and on the skin, <clears throat> but it's much less common. You'll notice symptoms with ingestion, for the most part, there are no symptoms. 63% of all of these cases did not have any symptoms. But 25% had vomiting, which is not a huge deal, except <coughs> that kids who vomit are more likely to aspirate. And that's what is a big problem. 
in this case. So coughing, um, pulmonary symptoms did include stridor, uh, also one pneumonia, and a uh, pneumonitis, double pneumonia. So drowsiness is very uncommon. We're not entirely sure why it happens. There's some uh, thought that it's perhaps the alcohol that's in the small pod, but it's really not enough to make anybody intoxicated, even a small child. So the jury's still out on that. <clears throat> so corneal abrasions, local irritation, we're the most worried about the eyes, of course, which is why we want to irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. Uh, damage is because it's alkaline and it actually breaks down the epithelial um, part of the cornea. For the most part, these are going to heal in seven to ten days with no problems. They're not going to have difficulty seeing, their corneas will be nice and flat and clear, uh, but you do want to immediately irrigate. So before the resident picks them up, do it in triage, just get it out of their eyes, especially off their skin if you can, and take their clothes off. <clears throat> and then endoscopy, it's a little unclear Do we need to do endoscopy if they get admitted and if they have symptoms and they're having some trouble Eating endoscopy might be an, an ideal thing to do. It's a little hard to say, and the evidence goes both ways. As far as do you need to screen for it, do you need to look for it? Because it does tend to get better. So again, we talked about the CNS depression. We're really not sure what it is, so the jury is still out. Hopefully they'll figure it out at some point, but it does happen in a small percent of cases. It's usually a little bit delayed, so it should be part of our discharge instructions that if your child becomes subtended, please bring it back to the emergency room. And then tell them what abundant means. <laughs> so now they're coming in containers that are a little harder for kids to open. They have these fancy stickers that say, please don't let your child with their doll play with these laundry pods. So that's good. But like I said, it's still there, there have been over 10,000 cases already this year in the US. So it's still a big problem. <clears throat> All right, we're going to move on to something else. Again, I don't know what a laundry pot is, but don't put it in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Or get it wet. Yes? Does that also happen with dishwasher pods? Not to this, uh, you know, that's a good question. We don't hear about it as much. So I don't believe so. The problem with this data is that it's voluntarily reported data to the voice control center. Because you don't have to call them, and a lot of people don't feel like they need to, and they can just treat this. So this is a numerator more than a denominator, and it's very possible we're missing a bunch of cases. 22-month-old male with seizure activity from one hour prior to arrival on the ED. Parents initially denied preceding illness, ingestion, or trauma. <clears throat> he does have a history of febrile seizures one month ago, but currently is a febrile. These are his vital signs and presentation, pretty normal for an almost two-year-old except for the tachycardia. Labs were done on him. Uh, he has a mildly high white count, mildly high glucose, and a normal urine hot screen. He did receive some Adivan while we were in the It was loaded with phosphonectin. He required some mass ventilation, but did not get intubated. MRI was done and normal. Uh, this is obviously longer than just an ER visit. But on quest a direct questioning, the father did then admit that the child had eaten a small piece of Alpine core. That's what he called it. And it had been placed around the apartment on the ground to control roaches. So before we get into what Alpine core is, 22-month-old with a febrile seizure, always think toxicology. It could just be the first seizure that they're having of their epileptic disease. It could be a febrile seizure and they don't have a fever currently. But always think about uh, toxicology in these cases. Common things being common in Oakland, think about cocaine. Unfortunately, we do see kids who are cocaine intoxicated and do have seizures. Anti-epileptics in high doses can actually cause seizures. So always think about that. And of course, carbon monoxide, cyanide. In the case of a fire, if you ever have a kid who comes in after a fire and is having seizures, those two things can cause seizures. Uh, local anesthetics, we may cause that either in the clinic or in the ER by giving an overdose of local anesthetics or the dentist, so consider those things. This is camphor, actually. Mm -hmm. So things like camphophenique, uh, Bengay, Vicks Vapo Rub. There are quite a few exposures every year still. Uh, it is a CNS stimulant, which is why it causes seizures. And it's used for many things that are not medicinal, but some medicinal purposes, some folk medicine remedies. Uh, but religious, spiritual, and some people even put it in food in Asia, in India, and the Middle East. So there's your Vicks Vapor Rub. Uh, the FDA does d limit the amount of camphor that can be in these over-the-counter preparations to 11%. So for the most part, they are not super toxic, but Campophonique is 10.6% or so, and just 
10 mLs of that can cause toxicity in a small child. Again, it would take a lot to get that down in an adult, but kids sometimes don't spit things out. So. Just to give you an idea of where you might see these things or what people might say when they come in and tell you that their child has eaten something, it can be placed in little mesh bags around the crib to protect the babies or uh, over the radiator as an air freshener. And that's easy for a little toddler to grab both of those things. It's also burned as part of a religious ritual, so multiple people could have toxicity if they're in an enclosed space. So these are some preparations that you might see. You'll notice it says edible on that one. It is in food sometimes. I guess it has a sweet dessert flavor to it if you put small amounts in. Uh, it's rapidly absorbed, so in the first 50, 5 to 30 minutes, you're going to see some GI upsets and vomiting. Um, you might have burning in the mouth. You should try and wash them out. <coughs> 20 to 30 minutes in, though, you may have abrupt onset of seizures, so that's not very long. So you may be seeing this as they're arriving in the emergency room on the clinic. They can get delirious, have muscle twitching, twitching coma, requiring intubation, uh, and again, aspiration might result in pneumonitis. It's very volatile. So a nine-year-old male with a bell of delay presents with dyspnea after drinking heat thinner that was left in the glass by his parents. Not uncommon that things are put in different containers and little kids grab the containers they're used to and drink them and it's something that shouldn't be in that container. So he was hospitalized, he was treated with antibiotics for pneumonitis. He was transferred a week later after he was not getting any better to a specialty hospital. This was in Argentina actually. So his saturations were very low, he was contracting, having a lot of respiratory distress, diffuse crackles in his lungs. He became worse on hospital day three in the specialty care center, and you'll notice that on the upper right, it's because he's got a big pneumothorax. But you'll notice the progression of his chest x-ray. He has small pneumonitis <coughs> on the left, and on the bottom, it's kind of everywhere. He's got pulmonary effusions, pearl effusions, uh, and he also has some necrotizing pneumonia. <coughs> So he did get better, but he was discharged on hospital day 40. 17-year-old <clears throat> male brought in by ambulance after an MBA. He was seen driving erratically and drove off the road. Passenger noted that he was unresponsive for several seconds just prior to crashing. Computer dust cleaner was found by paramedics in the center console. These are vital signs on arrival. He's tachypnic, he's tachycardic. He does have a normal O2 saturation, however. <clears throat> On physical exam, he's very agitated, he's a little altered, he's got some intraoral burns, and he's tachycardic. His EKG does actually have some frequent PVCs on it, and this is a 17-year-old kid. He required benzos for sedation and required several hours of observation in the emergency department before he recovered and was actually discharged home. His friend then admitted that he had a history of inhaled abuse. <clears throat> also known as nothing. So, for the most part, these are volatile hydrocarbons. There are some other things that kids can huff, but the majority of them are volatile hydrocarbons, uh, <clears throat> which is what we've been talking about the last couple of things of all the hydrocarbons. Problem is, they're cheap, they're available. You don't need to be 18 or 21 to buy them. They're very short lasting, so people will do them repeatedly. They can cause lightheadedness, hallucinations, euphoria, loss of coordination, and actual loss of consciousness, as we saw. The other issue is cardiac sensitization. So you saw that he was having some PVCs. It actually blocks a lot of the voltage-gated channels that are on the myocardium <clears throat> and can cause ectopy, be tacky, thin, can make them more sensitive to epinephrine and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having a very dry throat all of a sudden. So hydrocarbons, what are they? <clears throat> Crude oil goes in, they boil them, and they use their vapor points, and they turns into all of these fun things. Some of them are very uh, benign, such as gre greases, wax, petroleum jelly, things like that. You'll notice as they go up, the volatility goes up, and they become actually more and more toxic. So <clears throat> paraffin's not super toxic, but kerosene can be. Most of the time it's because it's so volatile and they will actually aspirate. So we see these things often, they're all over the place. Alcohols are in this group, as are glycols and ethers and ketones. We see a lot of lighter fluids, kerosene, furniture polish, and gasoline. Gasoline is the most common in this group of ingestions in little kids because it's very easy to get a hold of. For some reason, they think it smells kind of interesting and good. Um, it is poorly absorbed, so generally not systemically toxic, but it, watch for aspiration, it's very volatile. So just to give you kind of an idea of, because 
hydrocarbons are such a large group of things. So some things have no systemic toxicity and very high viscosity. That's like your petroleum jelly. <clears throat> For the most part, it's part of care. You don't have to decontaminate them. Things that have no systemic toxicity but low viscosity, so very volatile things, those are the things that you're going to have to watch for pneumonitis. Uh, and then unknown systemic toxicity, consider NG2 to suck it out, but you have to keep in mind that if it's something that's very volatile, sucking it out could make them aspirate more. And you can also consider charcoal. This, this is why it's good to call your poison control center because the list is too long for me to even show you all these hydrocarbons. Um, so it's good to elicit some help in figuring out how to treat these things. So things that are systemically toxic though, you, you really do probably want to consider charcoal depending on what it was exactly. Liquids can get absorbed from the stomach and pass through the stomach very quickly, so you may not be able to suck anything out actually. But always think about pneumonitis in these cases. So for the most part, you, get, you need to decontaminate them, take everything off. Activated charcoal may or may not be helpful, probably not going to be helpful, but again, talk to your poison control center or your toxicologist. You want to treat seizures with benzodiazepines. And you're not going to be able to dialyze these people. The volume of distribution is just too large as far as decontamination. So what does that mean, decontamination? Move the victim to fresh air if it's a volatile gas course. Take off all their clothes because it can be in the clothes and it can continue to produce gas as it uh, evaporates. Wash the skin either with water or soap and water. All the skin. And then make sure you wash the eyes out with either regular water or saline. And then consider the NG tube, NG tube if toxicity is possible. And keep in mind, if you're going to suck something out, you probably are going to have to intubate them to suck it out to ensure that they're not going to aspirate. So it's a big process. But in the case of something that's very toxic, it might not be a bad thing to consider. So pneumonitis, in the initial period, you may see coughing and wheezing from the inflammation in the lungs. Uh, you can consider doing an ABG to, see, to make sure they don't, uh, that they're oxygenating well enough if the pneumonitis is bad enough. Chest x-ray findings might be delayed. So you can have a kid with symptoms and a normal chest x-ray. And I would argue if they have symptoms with a normal chest x-ray, you should admit them for OBS. If they are asymptomatic after four to six hours, however, you don't need to do a chest x-ray and you don't need to admit them. But you do need to give them stricter term precautions. Uh, and there are no studies that show that steroids or prophylactic antibiotics have any um, help or any help at all. A lot of people will still use them though. <clears throat> Some hydrocarbons do actually have antidotes, so again, call your poison center, they will be able to tell you these things. Um, carbon tetrachloride is not something that we use anymore, it used to be in refrigerants and aerosol cans. Now it's used in industrial, rare industrial things that I can't tell you what they are off the top of my head, but <coughs> acetylcysteine is an antidote for this, it does cause liver necrosis, and that's why we use this in acetylcysteine, which is the Tylenol. Uh, they come in blue and not oxygenated, you want to consider methylene blue because they have methemoglobinemia. Um, we can cause it, we're more likely to cause this actually, it comes from medications, so things like benzocaine, lidocaine even, that we use a lot, Bactrim can cause it, uh, nitric oxide can cause it. <clears throat> so it's a good thing to keep in mind if you're having trouble oxygenating the kid. And then chelation therapy for leaded gasoline. Fortunately, we don't have that much leaded gasoline anymore, but. All right, case number three. Does anybody have questions about the last one? So, <clears throat> one time we had this kid come in uh, with a hydrocarbon poisoning and he ingested, like a four year old that ingested some like glade or something similar to glade, like you plug it into the wall and it has that oil. With oh, glade oil, oil, yeah. That's very good. Anyway, he, he drank it and um, they, so we called poison control and they said, well, you're putting on hydrocarbon precautions. And oh. we're like, well, what does that exactly mean? And they said, well, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta put him on hydrocarbon precaution. <laughs> they didn't further elaborate. Yeah. So, anyways, well, we were, I don't really know. So I went in, you know, talked to the attending, and he's like, well, uh, I guess we'll put him on a pulse ox. And yeah. I'm like, okay. And <laughs> what, what am I? And they said, you know, watching for four to six hours. I'm like, well, what are we watching him for? So coughing, wheezing, pulse ox is not a bad idea. Any retractions. Uh, I think it's not a bad idea that PO challenge these kids too, because they can't actually have oral burns and esophageal burns. So if they can't tolerate POs, they should probably also be admitted for observation. So I think those things, any respiratory distress at all, any oral swelling, especially if it's in the back and mouth, then I would step it up and admit these kids. <laughs> Sorry they didn't further elaborate, that makes no sense. Yeah, it was, it was a you should just know what that is already. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, 
26-month-old boy is taken to the emergency department after he and his four-year-old sister are caught playing with their mother's pill bottles. We've all seen this, right? <laughs> caught with grandma's pills. A girl that admits to giving him one pill, which is very nice that she's sharing. <laughs> they figure out that it's an extended release glucoside, which is a diabetic medication. <coughs> the pill count is deemed unreliable, as is the four-year-old. So we don't really know how many pills the little boy took. He arrives about 80 minutes after, his vital signs are normal, he's active, he's alert, he's playful, and his glucose is normal. They recheck it one hour after arrival, still normal. Approximately six hours later, though, it does drop, and he's kind of be a little sleepy and a little diaphoretic. He's given five cc's of D10, <coughs> and he approves right away, and his blood glucose is then 160. Despite several boluses of D25 and an infusion of D15, he continues to have multiple reoccurrences of this hypoglycemia. <clears throat> so we already know what this kid took, but it is again a good process to go through to think, what could this be? So the first three are all diabetic medications. Uh, the glutenide, I've never actually even seen it, but it also does release insulin. Ethanol, so regular alcohol, causes significant hypoglycemia in little children. So if they come in with an alcohol ingestion, you want to check the glucose. And then some metabolic things we are definitely not going to get into, but salicylates and valproic acid can also cause hypoglycemia and ex extended hypoglycemia. So good thing to think about. So ponyureas, there are many, there are not that many exposures, less than a thousand in 2013. I'm trying to up that again, do that to 2014, but it's generally about the same every year. Glucoside and liberide are the most common and it directly stimulates ins insulin release. It also makes the peripheral sensitivity better, and it re reduces glycogenolysis. So there's more insulin, they can use the insulin more effectively, making the glucose disappear from the bloodstream, and then they can't make new glucose. The three reasons why they're gonna be hypoglycemic. This is just enough to give you an idea of how quickly these turn on what the time of onset is, when they peak, and then how long they can last. And if you look at the duration of the extended release lipozide, it's 45 hours, which is quite a long time. So octretide was then given, given these multiple episodes of hypoglycemia, uh, and no, he did not have any more hypoglycemic events. The dextrose infusion was weaned and was stopped completely about 11 hours after the octreotide dose. <clears throat> so we're not gonna go into this in depth, I promise, but this is just to show you that if you give glucose, you will release insulin. So it's a little bit of a vicious cycle sometimes. You're chasing your tail, the glucose <coughs> goes up, and then it goes down because there was a glucose release too. So octreotide is gonna act up there in the top right. It's gonna block that channel and they won't be able to release insulin. So you're just kind of helping yourself out. You, you'll still have to give glucose. You'll still have to do the same amount of glucose checks, but hopefully you're getting yourself out of the cycle of hypoglycemia and giving dextrose. So the Poison Control Center here in San Francisco actually did a study where they retrospectively reviewed kids less than six who developed hypoglycemia after ingesting these. So what they did was a time of onset of hypoglycemia.